turn to the, the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis. Chapter 4. If any of you would like to sometime bring your Bible, you think you'd enjoy that to have the word right in front of you. Have the word right in front of you. Verse 1. Now the man had relationships with his wife Eve, and she conceived and she gave birth to Cain. And she said, I've gotten a man child with the help of the Lord. Again, she gave birth to her, his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of ground. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, of his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and their fat portion. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offerings he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. And then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and it desires for you, but you must master it. Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about that they were in the fields, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. And killed him. Wow. What a story. What a story. Let us pray. The prayer out of Ephesians. Together. We pray out of your glorious riches, you may strengthen CCC with power through your spirit in the inner being so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith and that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints, what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled to all your fullness. Amen. Well, I will tell you this prayer is a powerful prayer. And what makes it so powerful is because we're praying to Almighty God to ask him to do something that he wants to do. <laughs> because it's ordained in Scripture. And when you see it ordained in Scripture, this is how he wants us to be. He wants us to live the results of this prayer. And so we pray out of his glorious riches that he may strengthen us with power through his spirit in our inner being so Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. I love that line because he says that he, he says through his power, your power, through your spirit, his, his power only comes through his spirit and that power in the spirit into our inner being. What's our inner being? That's our born again nature in that place where Christ dwells inside of us. And this is what he's asking, that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, through faith. Now, I can't say this enough because, you folks, when we're praying for his power, I see so many in the church, I want his power, I want his power, I want his power. If you want his power, you're saying, I want his faith. Because what you're saying there is because I can't have any power without faith. And that faith is going to come when he dwells in my heart. Okay, all the things, if you believe, you'll do the same things I've been doing. You can't have any of that power until you have faith. That's the reason we pray this prayer. That out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen us with power through his spirit in our inner being. So Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. So what happens when I'm praying that prayer? What I'm praying is that he will dwell in my heart. Christ dwells in my heart. When Christ dwells in my heart, who do I commune with? Christ. I'm not communing with the world. I'm communing with Christ. And when I'm communing with Christ, I'm in relationship with him. And so then I'm walking. I'm then walking by his faith. Ooh. We prayed for Steph the other night. We were praying with Jesus' faith. Because we were communing with Jesus and his power was upon us. And we were praying Jesus' faith and Jesus healed us. It has nothing to do with Rusty. It has nothing to do with Devin or anybody else who's there. And it only had to do with Jesus there and his faith. Okay? We were conduits. We were co-laborers. Okay? Wow. 
So, and then he says, to be comprehend that I'm rooted and established in love. And I love the fact that we've established in this love. And the fullness of this is he wants us to live in this deep, deep love. All right, so with that said, we've been talking the last couple of weeks, well, last since I've got off surgery, talk about love. We've been talking about love, the power of love. And what I realize, and, and, and we're going to go back to First Thess- First Corinthians uh, chapter 13. And in this little phrase in verse 5, we, we looked last week, it says, love does not act unbecomingly, love does not seek its own, love is not provoked, love does not take into account wrong suffered or thinketh no evil. Last week we took that this little phrase, love is not provoked. And one of the things that God spoke to us, that means I'm not, love is not offended. You don't get offended when you walk in love. All right? And one thing we challenged this past last week is, is that, have you been offended this week? Has there been things in your life that have offended you? All right? And we looked at last week of what all the things that can offend us. Of, you know, offended means that I have hurt feelings. I get annoyed. I get disappointed. I get upset. I get angry. I get sorrowful. And we get sad. I mean, this, we feel like we've been treated unjustly. Okay, so that's how I did. And we looked at that. And I want to just incorporate it that because this is kind of a springboard into what we're doing this week. What we find is being offended easily means I'm, I've got a self-centered view of life. And often we just and I get offended because something does, somebody's done something to me. And I just, we listed a couple of things. Think about it. We get offended by words. Things that people say. I mean, I saw something the other day that, is, is there a co- comedian named Will McDonald? I think there's a comedian named Will McDonald, okay? He was supposed to be on The Tonight Show. They canceled his appearance. The reason they canceled his appearance is because he did not 100% agree with the Me Too movement. He agreed with it 95%, but there's a part of it he didn't agree with it. So because he articulated what he felt, they said, yeah, you're canceled. Because his words offended the co- co-producers or whatever of The Tonight Show. Gone. And you think about how many times well, we, because we offended. I mean, yesterday I told you at that funeral. They didn't want me to mention much of Jesus because Jesus would offend them. Huh. Isn't that interesting? And isn't it interesting? We get offended. And we talked last week about uh, we get offended because other people might be right. And we've, and we've set the standard of what I think is right. And what I think is right, and if somebody disagrees with me, I can get offended. That happens in politics all the time. It happened just what we're talking about. But it's interesting. Jesus was the king of offended people. <sighs> because he told truth. And the truth, I mean, again, the people didn't want to hear Jesus yesterday because it, he offended them. And he'll do that. He'll do that. Okay, and... We, we get offended because we never ask the question, why am I being offended in the first place? Can you imagine if we really asked ourselves, why am I being offended, and we began to work on that, we would quit being offended. But we don't ask that question. Instead, most of us just continue being offended. We get offended because people don't, we don't appreciate others where they are right now. In other words, we put judgment on them. And because they did something against us. And this past week, it was really good for me. I'm sitting on the corner of Walker Mill Road and Southern Boulevard at South Avenue. And as I'm sitting there, it's a busy thoroughway, and I had to turn left. And sometimes the left can be a real challenge. There was an older woman in front of me. She had one of those old cars like mine, a Buick. (sighs) And as she sat there, I could have sworn we could have gotten five semi-trucks pulled out to the left before she pulled out. And I'm sitting there. I go, okay, Lord, bless this woman. Father God, she's scared right now. She's unsure about how to drive right now. She's older. She's shaking. And she wants to be sure. So, Lord, will you get her to that destination? Boy, that's a whole lot different than I've done in the past. <sighs> yeah, honk of the horn. Come on, get moving, lady. <sighs> but what's the deal? But, you know, that could have offended me. Okay. 
But now, when you develop a deeper heart for Jesus, now you see where they're not and what they need to be and how you can bless them instead of cursing them and being upset at them. Okay? Well, yeah. <laughs> well, isn't that the truth, Linda? I mean, you know, and I don't mean, I mean, but you think about all the people at Subway that come in, and they can be pretty rude. Okay? So what begins to happen if you look at them, oh, God, look at them right now. They need help. God, look at them. They're so angry. They're so mean. God, and it's not about you. It's about where they're at. So if you're, as you're walking in the Lord and practicing his presence, you can pray silently over them and be a blessing to them. This, and, and as you're a blessing and kindness to them, you know, what's that verse out of Isaiah when you heap coals on their head? <sighs> okay? You're heaping coals on their head. They go, oh my gosh, what happened? Somebody blessed me. And I was mean to them. <sighs> I mean, I'm nice to Woody all the time, and look how he treats me. Okay? <sighs> Oh, isn't it great to be fun? <sighs> oh, not really. <laughs> but, but, you know, when we can bless people in the midst of them offending us, that's a lighthouse. And that's what God wants from us. Right? And the last way we looked at is that we often get offended because we live for me instead of him. And that is what happens when I'm just standing in line. I'm not saying you, but any of us. And we get offended. When we're living for me, I can get offended. But when I'm living for him, I can't get offended. Huh? Amen. 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 All right. With that said, then, a reason I say that, because really being offended is a springboard into the next one. It's being taken account into wrongs suffered. Into wrongs suffered. Because, you know, and I love this translation. And because... This little phrase, you understand, in Greek, in the Greek, they would have a phrase. And there's no Greek word that often will capture in English. So sometimes you have to put different words in different meanings. And so there's, in, in, the, in the main ones, in the main translations that I think are the most accurate, they have different translations here. The one that I use, the New American Standard Version, has this translation. Love does not take into account wrong suffered. In other words, it keeps no records of wrong. Now, what, the vision I have of this is often what happens is that I, I visualize this big di diary. Any of you ever take a diary? Ever, ever write a diary? And when you write this diary, imagine your whole life. You wrote everything down that things happened to you. Well, she treated me like an idiot. She called me this. He did this. Blah, blah, blah. And you li list all these things that somebody did to you. And often we have that in the bank of our mind. Okay? And it's stopped and still there. And he says, take no account of that. Get that diary sheet. Okay? And we've all got a diary sheet in the back of our heart and the back of our mind. It's a matter of what we've done with that. We'll talk about that in a minute. <sighs> okay. But it's a diary sheet of all the people who have hurt us, all the people who have offended us, all the people who have, have mistreated us, have done dastardly things to us. Okay? You all know what I'm talking about? I like the, the King James Version. The King James Version says, thinketh no evil. Now, I really like that version, too. Because what happens? We got the diary sheet, and we're thinking evil about the folks on the diary sheet. Are there certain people's, I can say their name, and all of a sudden you go, mm. okay? He wants that gone. Now, what I love about that, that translation, thinketh no evil, when you think about evil, what do you think of? You think of rapists. You think of people who aren't getting to heaven. Well, he's telling us very clearly. Love thinketh no evil. He's calling evil in the same context that we think of evil as rape and murder. He's saying it's evil if you take account to somebody who's done you wrong and you're living in that. Whoa. Evil. Now that, that, that cuts our heart, doesn't it? That cuts our heart. That's how God views it. I'm, not tell, I'm just telling you what God says. Another translation, English Standard, I like this too. It's not resentful. Love is not resentful. Well, again, we'll look at our diary list and all the things that people may have done to us and how do I get to a place? Love does not resent anything anybody's ever done to me. Wow. That's what love is all about. And God talks us to walk in love. And you think about it. 
how we get so, we can, we can, th think about the resentment and, and the anger that we hold. It's, it can be much, isn't it? Sometimes it'll control us a little bit, but sometimes it controls our life. I mean, think about how much, how we live right now is often determined by what has happened in my past, and I still hold on to that anger against so-and-so in my past, and I may not articulate it, but underneath it, that rage is rolling through my inner being. And it affects who I am, and I'm not set free, and I'm letting them dictate my past, and they don't even care about you. <sighs> Do you realize how stupid it is to hold on to that stuff? Huh? Yeah, it damages yourself. It's killing you, and you're holding on to all that stuff. You know, I, I put it here. It's plain stupid. <sighs> Why am I going to let somebody in my past dictate who I am now? Uh -uh. I mean, that's just foolishness at its best. And we'll say, well, you don't know what they did to me. Well, we don't know what we did to Jesus. <sighs> that's pretty good, isn't it? We put him to the cross, and he forgave me. So anything anybody's done to you, <coughs> we need to root that out. See, resentments, you know what resentments are? They're like a deep weed. They're like weeds, okay? And they, keep, they get deeper, and they grow deeper into your garden. I mean, if you went to our backyard, it is one of the most beautiful weed fields you'd ever want to see. We got this creeping Charlie, and it started with a little one. Now, mind you, I hate, I hate Roundup and stuff because it's bad for us. You know, we got the fruit trees and we got our garden, and, and so we don't put that on it. Instead, so we get Creeping Charlie. And what ends up happening, it's all over our yard. We have no grass. We just cut weeds. When I say go cut the grass, I just say, Linda, I'm going to cut the weeds. <laughs> okay? But that's what's happened. It's infiltrated our entire backyard. But see, what's happened? It started little, and then it grew, and it grew. And you think, isn't that what happens to us? Somebody does something to me that I feel is unjust. And it begins to gravitate in my heart. And it begins to sit there. And as it begins to sit there, it begins to invest in me. It starts small, and the intensity gets bigger. I remember before I let go all of my stuff with my dad. It started when he wouldn't go to the ball games. He called me all kinds of stuff. You know, he treated, he's a, he's a drunk, he's an alcoholic, he did all that stuff. You can relate, huh? Huh? Like a grudge. That's exactly right. That's good then. And so, so this grudge built and a resentment built. And, and every time he walked into the room, okay. And as you walk, and, you didn't, and you'd smile, try to say everything's okay, but down deep, you all know what I'm talking about? Okay. And it builds there. And it doesn't do you any good. And what happens? You get distrustful. What happens? You, you hurt against other people. What happens? You get defensive. What happens? You, you're waiting for them to apologize, and they're not going to apologize because they're living like the world. So you feel betrayed. You feel hurt. And all this stuff begins. Then what happens? You start replaying this stuff in your mind. Do you ever replay stuff in your mind? It's like that recording back in that DVD. And it keeps wiring back and forth. And it keeps going back and forth. And you can find yourself getting more rage and all that stuff. And what does it do? It does nothing for you. It does nothing good for you. Okay? What it does, it, it, it hurts us more than anybody else. As I said, it's stupid. We hold on to it. Okay? It, we no longer have peace of mind. It obstructs our emotional and spiritual growth. There's no peace whatsoever. We feel frustrated all the time. We become irritable. We experience physical symptoms, often ulcers, headaches, stomach aches, et cetera, et cetera. That's right. Aches your heart. That's right. All those things. As we hold on to this stuff. So we ask ourselves, why do we do it? It doesn't do us any good. I love the story we read today in, in Genesis. Now, we could say a lot about this story, but we're going one particular way today. In the story of Genesis, think about this story. Sin had just occurred. Man had just fallen from, uh, from the perfect union with God. They had been now kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Now they had to actually work. <sighs> and so what happened here, we see that it says man or Adam had a relationship with his Eve. 
his wife Eve, and she conceived, and she gave birth to Cain. And she said, I've gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. So we, she recognizes this is all a gift from God. And I think it's interesting. So we have Cain. He's the firstborn. Now, let me tell you about firstborns. Okay, any of you firstborns? Okay, all right. <laughs> me too, all right? But let me tell you about firstborns, okay? Okay, mind you, this is sinfulness at its best. Sinfulness have to be first. Sinfulness, the firstborn usually want to be dominant. Firstborns always want to be the leader of the family. The firstborns are want to be controlling of the family. Firstborns always want to be right. The firstborns often want to be praised. Yes. Okay. All right. Very good. Okay. Well, I'm talking when you have other siblings. Okay. Okay. Firstborns want to get the attention. Okay. I know that because I was a firstborn. I know that I watched my grandson. <sighs> okay. Firstborns have those tendencies. All right. So he then has to get a brother because. His dad and mom got together again, called him Abel. And Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground, it says. So one was taking care of the sheep and all the goats and everything, and he was on the ground digging and doing all that good stuff. And it, said, it says in verse 3, And it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the first of the ground. So look what he did. It didn't say he was had to. We don't know how it all came to be. But all we know is that Cain went and brought an offering to the Lord. Then it says, Abel, on his part, also brought the firstling of his flock and their fat portion. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. Oh, so you're a big brother. You're the one who offered the offering first. You brought your, 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 uh, your, your crops. And your brother came and brought his animal. And it said, the difference you see here is one brought the first of his crops. The other one, it says, I'm sorry, the first of, of, of his animals, his sacrifice, the blood. And the other one brought his, it says he brought crops. So again, we don't know why. We don't know why God didn't regard it, but that could be one of the ways. It could have been the heart. Abel took the best that he had. He took the first that he had. You know, that's the reason we got tithing. The reason we tithe, we take our first fruits, and we give back to God what God has first given us. So when you make a dollar, you to give 10 cents to God. I mean, that's what we do. We give our first fruits back to God because God wants us to give with a joyful heart because he's the one who's the giver of all things. So we give. We see that Abel gave his first flocks, his first yearlings, but we see Cain, it seems like he just brought something. So he brought something, and he sees that his brother's is accepted. Now, he's the big brother. He's the one who is always supposed to be praised. He's the one who wants to be honored because he's the oldest, and his other brother is getting all the glory. Now, what happens? He becomes angry. As he becomes angry, we see that his countenance begins to fall. That means his face begins to down. His heart begins to hurt. Okay? His brother's being praised, and he is not. His brother's getting honor, he is not. His brother's getting the attention, he is not. But what does God do? God, in his kindness, he, he asks these questions. Why are you angry? Why is your countenance down? I'm going to tell you something right now, folks. God is so good because he'll ask you questions. See, God is asking the questions to stir thought process. So he says, hey, why are you, why are you angry? Why is your countenance down? Why are you acting like this? Huh? And then he turns it around, and he says, if you do well, Will not your countenance be lifted up? Now God gives the solution. And if you do well, sin is crouching at the door and desires it for you. You must master it. He tells him what he must do. He's telling him sin is threatening you. Don't go there. It's crouching at its door. You must master it. You must control it. Okay. So what does he do? <laughs> he takes his brother out. And what God had just did he scolded him, he challenged him, he told him truth. How is he going to respond to this? Was he going to be continued offended? Was he continue to be resentful towards his brother? How is he going to respond? This is how he responds. 
It says, Cain told Abel his brother. I thought that's good. He told his brother. But how many times we might, have you ever been mad at somebody and then you put your arms around them and say, it's okay, I, I, I'm your friend. I, you were okay together. But behind your back, you want to stab them. <laughs> okay, you know what I'm talking about? We've, okay. And we've, we have resentment towards them because they got something. But we're going, atta boy, you did good. <laughs> Down deep, huh? That's what's happening here. So he goes and tells his brother, and the next thing we know, they go out into the field, it says. And what does he do? He kills him. He kills him. Why? Because he had resentment in his heart. He was resentful towards his brother. And he was resentful to all those around him. Starting with God. He was mad at God. All right. The good news is, folks, God doesn't want you to carry this. God wants all of it gone. He said, how many times do you forgive? Seventy times seventy? Peter asked. And now, he said seven times, and God says 70 times seven. That's 490 times you're supposed to forgive. <sighs> that means infinite, folks. You forgive. The question, how do you get to that place? I'd like to share a story. This story rocked me. At the funeral, after the funeral, we went and sat with my dear friend, Pastor Raphael Cruz, and and Raphael has got a real wonderful city ministry and reaching out. In fact, we support the ministry. But he told me a story that happened many years ago. He, that lady has since now died uh, for complications of an illness. But he said one day, he and his wife went to the hospital because uh, his wife had an, uh, uh, an appointment, and they were in the waiting room. And before you know it, they got chit-chatting and, and found out he's a pastor, et cetera, et cetera. She goes, I'd like to come to your church. And she said she started coming to the church. She had a real joy about her. And uh, Pastor Cruz got to know her quite well. And so it came to the place that uh, she told C Pastor Cruz her testimony. She said, I'd like to share this with the church. And this was the testimony. She said, when I was a young girl, she said I had a couple older brothers. But I had a dad and a mom. And every time my Mom went to the store. My dad would grab me, beat me, and rape me. Every single time. Mom would leave, and I'd go hide. I'd go hide in the closet. I'd hide under the beds. I'd go hide anywhere. But he'd find me, drag me out, and he'd do it again. He'd call me the B word, and he just was cruel and mean to me said, when he would do his thing against me, I just went mentally, I just go lost. I think about something else, anything to get lost because it was so horrific. She said that when she's 13, she went and told her mom. Her mom slapped her and said, hey, you're trying to steal my husband. Oh, the, and she said, before you knew it, her brothers and I were uh, part of the rape, you know. And called her the B word. Told her we're no good for nothing. She didn't even deserve to live. And she had this aura of just, just anger and regression and just hatred towards herself and the world. She felt like nothing. At 18, she moved out. And she got a job. And she got a job. She, she got this job. And there was a Christian woman there. And, says, and she saw this lovely woman who just radiated Jesus and and so the woman asked her, would you like to come to church sometime with me? And she didn't know what church was. She never knew anything about church. She was secluded basically as a victim in her house other than go to school. And so she goes, yeah, I'll come. Because now she had a little friend. That's what we Christians do. We reach out. And she says, why don't you come? And so she came to church, and she liked it. She liked the praise. She liked the love. She, she'd never seen anything like this. She heard a message of Jesus. She says, Wow. So she started coming to some Bible studies. She started coming to different things, and she began to grow. And one day she met with the pastor, and she told the pastor her story. And the pastor turned to her and said, I want to tell you something. When I was a young boy, I was raped too. 
by many men. And he turned to her and he said, you must forgive. She goes, I can't. How do you do this? It hurts so bad. It's what you do. Go into your prayer closet with the word of God. And you turn to God and say, God, in the name of Jesus, help me to forgive my dad. In the name of Jesus, help me to forgive my brothers. You tell me in Scripture, it says, he who calls upon the Lord will be delivered. So I began calling upon the Lord. I did it for one month, two months, and he told me when I... I felt that release. I need to write everything down, all my memories, write them on a piece of paper. And I did then. And so I wrote them all on this piece of paper. And I just began crying out to God, crying out to God, crying out to God. And before you know it, one night, his presence entered. And I had this peace, this tremendous peace. I forgave my dad. And I took the piece of paper and I put it in the shoebox like he told me and bring it to the altar that Sunday. And I did. And when I got to church and I put it on the salt altar, he looked at me. He realized I had peace and I had forgiveness. And after the service, we took that shoebox and we went outside and we burned it. He said, it's gone. As far as the east is to the west, all those memories. I'm now a child of God. I'm not letting those memories control me anymore. I'm a child of God, and I believe I'm a child of God, and I forgive all those who are in front of me. And then she got a phone call a couple months later from from her cousin saying her dad was dying. And so she went to the hospital, and she opened the door. And dad looked at her. He said, hey, you bee, get out of here. And the nurse looked at that was in the room. He says, who, is, who are you? He says, I'm his daughter. And she turned to hit the, her dad and says, you stop her right now. You haven't had one visitor here. You visit with your daughter. So she got up and left, and the daughter came in. And the dad just looked at the ceiling. He says, get out of here. No, I'm not getting out, Dad. I'm not getting out. I don't know why you've called me a bee all these years. And I'm not sure why you've done such hideous acts toward me. And why you treated me so evil. And why you treated me like garbage. And why you did what you did. But you know that you were wrong. His hands held and looking in the ceiling. She said, I want to let you know something. I've come to know Jesus as the Lord of my life. And I want you to know something. I forgive you. Everything you've ever done, everything you've ever said, I forgive you and I love you. I love you. Christ died for you. Just as he died for me. And he wants to set you free. Just like he set me free. At that point he just. Released his arms. Began to weep. But he asked her to forgive him. He asked Jesus into his life. Folks, that's powerful. The point is this. Love does not hold account wrong. Love is not resentful. Love does not think of evil. If you've got your diary list and you've got a bunch of names on it that every time you go uh, uh, about that, every time you think of them, it tells us something that you need to get rid of it. And I'm here.
here to tell you, you can't in and of yourself. But it's Christ and Christ alone. That you turn into Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, I surrender this hurt to you. I forgive so and so. Deliver me from this hurt. I want to love them as you love me. As you hung on that cross for my sin. And all the things I've done to you. All the things I've done against you. All, all my activities were worldly. Forgive me. He forgave me. Now, Lord, forgive. Allow me to forgive them. You see, this is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. When you fall in love deeper with Jesus, he begins to take your heart and allows you to go into places, to deeper into him, to walk like him. And if you know there's one of those arenas in your life, that little chamber of your heart that's still got that diary, go there. Don't wait. Don't let it affect your heart. Don't let it affect your life. Don't let it affect your emotions. Because you're born, if you're born again, which I believe all of us are here, if we are born again believers, this means that that is not to dictate my life. What is to dictate my life is I'm a new creation. I am loved. And I'm to walk in that love. Amen. How many of you feel like you've still got stuff you've got to get rid of? Let's take a few moments, okay? And just rest in Him. Then we're going to come back together. We're going to pray. And I want you to be honest with God. Be honest. Yeah, that's right. He knows. He can't hide from God. See, I remember my dad, when all the stuff with my dad I've told you in the past, I, I tried to hide from God. But it didn't work. I had to get rid of it. You got to get rid of your stuff, folks. You got to get rid of it. And he wa he'll help you. He wants to get rid of it. So look at your diary right now. Who is that? Be honest. Thank you, dear God, that you came. To this world through Jesus Christ. Thank you that you sent your son to set us free. Free from anger, free from rage. You came to set us free. To live in grace, in grace and love and peace. confess to you, Lord. Many of us harbor deep anger and resentment. We kept a diary keeping the records of wrong that people have sinned against us and hurt us. And we've let it capture our heart. Be 
and want that no more. We want to be totally free to love everyone that has hurt you. So we pray this prayer. You said, Lord, if we call upon your name, we will be delivered. We come before you right now in the name of Jesus. Repeat after me. I come before you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, and declare to you, I will no longer hold anger, grudge, unforgiveness against whoever that may be. I call upon you, Lord, to draw me unto yourself into a deeper way that I may see the power of your love and the power of your grace and forgive as you forgave me in the name of Jesus. Father God, help each one of us to pray this every day until it's totally released from our spirit. Every day, go to you say, Lord, I ask that you help me to forgive so and so. In the name of Jesus, I declare I forgive so and so. I forgive so and so. Help us to get to that place, God, that we're totally forgive them, totally free. That we can love as that young woman loved her dad after the horrific things he did. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, God, for the peace that passes all understanding. love you, Lord. We thank you, God. We praise you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And Father God, I thank you for this precious group of people. I thank you for these precious saints. I just thank you, God, that you love each one of them so much. I just pray, God, you just carry them in your arms. Allow them to care, allow them to surrender everything so you can carry them and myself and just take us to that deep level of love that we just may be lovers of you everywhere we go. So bless and keep them in your grace and your mercy. May we walk with a grace-filled heart, forgiving all those around us and loving them for Jesus. In his name I pray. <coughs> Do we have amazing grace? I feel we need to call. Do you have amazing grace in the way up there, Andy? Let's pray and sing it. Amazing grace. <coughs> the Son that saved the wretch. Like me, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to My fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear. The hour I first believed. Last verse, Andy. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now. 
that line, I once was lost, but now I see. What do you see now? God's love, grace, beauty, and absolute love. Okay. Live that out. Live that out. Help, you know, help me. We, we wrote that song, Help Me to See with the Eyes of Jesus. Help me to see people as you see them. That's with faith. If we do that, you're going to see a magnificent change. Amen. Go in his peace. Go tell somebody about Jesus today, all right? Amen. Live Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, remember, we got the dinner tonight. We got the dinner. Oh, good. <laughs>